This month, we're going to look at the story of Christ, the story of Christmas, through the primary colors of the Christmas story. And today, we kick off our Christmas series, The Colors of Christmas. Would you lift up your voice and would you ask God to talk to us in the next few moments of this service? Jesus, we love you and we thank you for your presence. Speak to us today. Change hearts and lives by the sweeping of your spirit and the authority of your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And you can be seated in Jesus' name. When our minds think of Christmas. Our traditions are as diverse as the multicolored lights on a Christmas tree. The stories we tell, the climates we celebrate in, hot or cold or warm or somewhere in between. If you're in the Midwest, right here in the QC, hopefully we're going to have a cold, snowy Christmas. And all the church said amen. Hey, save the boo birds for the Cubs, the Cardinals, whoever else, okay? <laughs> um, I may be alone, but I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. So. <laughs> we, we, the, the Christmas traditions are as diverse as you can imagine. Some uh, like Christmas warm, some like it cold, some celebrate here or there. It's, it's some celebrate at home, some celebrate with friends, some celebrate with immediate families, extended families, some celebrate with gifts on Christmas, some without, some with gifts on Christmas Eve, some without. One, one thing is constant, no matter where or how you celebrate in the Western world or no matter where or how you decorate or no matter where or how you participate, the colors, uh, the primary colors of Christmas are fairly consistent and, and, and without a doubt there are some overarching common colors in the Christmas story. Uh, one of the colors, and we'll look at a different color each Sunday morning this month all the way through Sunday the 31st. I would have to say that probably red would be one of the primary colors of Christmas. You see it everywhere. This story that we celebrate at Christmas time of this baby born in a manger in Bethlehem come to, to save the world. Why, uh, why do we use red in Christmas? I would submit to you that red is one of the primary colors of Christmas. For believers, for disciples of Jesus Christ, because we understand that we celebrate more than Santa and we celebrate more than uh, red wrapping paper and we celebrate more than uh, Rudolph's nose that is the beacon for Santa's sleigh. Uh, or if that offends you, I'm sorry. Uh, we celebrate more than red lights and, and tinsel on trees, but we celebrate that there was a child that was born. And this child was not just born to live, this child was born to die. We celebrate red as a color of Christmas, not just because of all of the other elements of the Christmas story in our modern tellings of the story, but we celebrate red as a color of Christmas because today what I've come to preach to you is that red represents the gift of redemption. And the Christmas story is all about the story of redemption. Without redemption, the Christmas story is all for naught. It means nothing and has no application to our life other than something we decorate for and gather around once a year. Red is the color of redemption. It's the color of redemption because the baby whose story we tell is a story that doesn't just celebrate birth, but as I said already, it celebrates death. He died that you and I might live. He lived to die, but he died that we might live. We who were dead in our trespasses and our sins, we, you and I, who had a death sentence pronounced over our life from the day that we were born, thank God that we celebrate 
not just a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, but we celebrate a king that was born that he might live and die and die so that you and I might live. That's why the Lord would say through the prophet Isaiah, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord of hosts in Isaiah 118. Though your sins be as scarlet or deep dark red, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. The Lord said before the Christ child was ever born, he spoke through the prophet Isaiah to let us know that the baby that was coming to be born would be born so that the stain of sin could be removed from your life so that the pain of sin could be removed from my life. I'm happy to tell you today that we celebrate at Christmas season the greatest gift we could ever receive and it doesn't come under a Christmas tree but it is the gift of redemption. It is the gift that was bought by Christ himself. We celebrate the gift of redemption and the gift because of the blood that flowed red when that child that grew into the man, Jesus Christ, was crucified for your sins and mine. We celebrate the gift of his blood that was shed that you and I might have forgiveness of sins. It is the greatest gift. No batteries needed. No screwdrivers or assembly required. No maintenance or warranty necessary. But the gift of redemption is truly, now people say this all the time, the gift that keeps giving, uh, and, and I'm sorry, the jelly club is not the gift that keeps giving. Yeah. Yeah. The fruit of the month club, that's cool if that's your thing, you like fruit, whatever, but that, that's not the gift that keeps giving. The gift that truly keeps giving is the gift of redemption. And that gift was purchased by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I thank God for the blood. Hebrews chapter 9 says, without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of our sins. I thank God that my sins can be remitted because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I thank God that as the Bible says, the blood of Jesus cleanses us, 1 John. From all of our sins, I've come to declare to somebody today, there is still cleansing in his blood. There is still cleansing from that crimson stream that flows from Calvary. There is still cleansing offered by the blood of Jesus. Red is the color of Christmas. Not because of Santa's hat or Rudolph's nose. Red is the color of Christmas. Because we celebrate the blood that flowed at Calvary. That your sins could be remitted, could be blotted out, could be wiped away forever, never to be held against you again. The first verse in your Bible that deals with Christmas. It's not the virgin being told that she's going to give birth. It's not. It's not even back in Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us is born this, this child, this wonderful counselor. It's, it's not even those passages, but all the way back to the very first book of your Bible, you will find the very first Christmas reference. The very first reference pointing toward red that is to come. And that is in the very beginning of your Bible. We find that man failed. Man sinned. And sin separates us from God. Sin separates unholy creatures from a perfectly holy God. It was after God's judgment upon man that, that Lucifer came uh, to the Lord and, and, and this exchange happened. And we find in Scripture from the sin of Adam and Eve uh, to the exchange of Lucifer and the Lord and the casting down uh, of, of Lucifer, this whole progression and story, this narrative uh, of, of Scripture, God gave a promise not only to us, uh, but he promised the devil himself that there is going to be a baby one day that will be born. And that that baby will stomp your head so hard. He will bruise your head and he's going to bruise his own heel, indicating the suffering that the Christ would, that would come to the Christ. 
He said, this baby that is going to be born, he's going to stomp your head so hard. He is going to bruise his heel, but he's going to bruise your head. Let me tell you, you can heal from a bruised heel. But you get hit in the head, buddy, it's game over. He was saying, you might temporarily wound the Christ child. You're going to put a spear in his side. You're going to put thorns on his head. But he is going to mortally wound you. He is going to take the grip and the pain of sin out of your hands. And he is going to lead captivity free. He is going to lead mankind into liberty. We celebrate redemption today. We declare the story of redemption and it speaks from the beginning of your Bible to the end. Oh, somebody ought to thank him for the gift of redemption right now. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. To understand redemption, the idea of redemption, redemption defined is, is simply something. Redemption refers to the process by which something is purchased back. Something which is purchased back that has been lost and is being held for ransom. In other words, something was lost. It was being held at ransom. And a price had to be paid for that to be purchased back. That's the concept of redemption. The concept of redemption. The relationship between economics and redemption is inseparable. Redemption has to do with economics. It's the concept of redemption is rooted in a business transaction. Because in a business transaction, you, you, you look at your debt column. The column of listed debts. And you have to reconcile those debts. You have to redeem those debts. You have to pay off or purchase those debts. Now, hopefully I'm not speaking prophetically of what you're going to need to do to your credit cards in January. Okay? <laughs> Christmas is much happier and so is January when you don't do it on a credit card. There's your free commercial, okay? All right? <laughs> Back to the Bible. Which that actually is in the Bible too, but that's another message for another time. You want to reconcile the debt. You want to pay off the debt. It's, a, it's, it's, it's rooted in a business concept. You want to pay off the debt. An account has to be made. The debt has to be redeemed. Brothers and sisters, the bottom line of redemption is this. You and I had a debt that we could not Hey, oh, but I'm happy to tell you today that Jesus paid it all on the cross of Calvary. Jesus came to redeem your debt. He came to move your, your sin from the debt column and mark it paid. How was it paid? It was paid by his shed blood. It was paid by his suffering. It was paid by the spotless lamb who shed blood for you. If we were to line out your debts, they would be too many to list. If we were to line out your sins, they would be too many to list. There's no way we could list all of your sins or mine. We would run out of paper at the store listing all of your sins. But I thank God that the ransom was paid, that Christ came. He was born to die, and he died that we might live. He was born to die, and he died that you and I might have life and more abundantly from the beginning of the world. This is why. This is why this, this idea even, it goes from Genesis to Revelation. From the beginning of your Bible to the end of your Bible. It starts pointing toward redemption and it ends celebrating redemption. Your Bible in your hand. It begins and ends. It's bookend with redemption. John the Revelator sees the heavens uh, and the Bible says when he saw a vision of heaven, he saw a stone. Revelation chapter 4, he saw a stone. He could only describe the color of the stone. Now to, to grasp this, you have to understand the Jews were very, they were very careful about describing God. They would not 
articulate much or describe God in much detail. And in John, or in Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 2, he said, I immediately was in the Spirit and I, uh, I saw a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. And verse 3 says, uh, and, and, and when I sat and I looked upon him, it was like a jasper, a sardine stone. Everybody say a stone. stone. There was this stone. When he sees the Redeemer, the King of Kings, the only description is a stone. Everybody say a stone. He just sees a big stone. And the only thing he describes it as is this deep, dark color of red, this sardine color, deep, the the deepest hue of red you can imagine. Like if you look at the food coloring bottle that you're about to put in your cookie icing recipe, it's like that deep of red. He says, I see this sardine stone, this deep, dark red stone, and he doesn't fully understand it. He doesn't fully grasp it, but in his effort to very minimally describe God and the face of God, he says it's just a sardine stone, and he doesn't understand it until we get a little further in Scripture. Let me just say, if you don't understand what you're reading in the Bible, don't stop reading, keep reading. Because the deeper you get in the narrative of Scripture, you'll understand the whole counsel of God. It'll all make sense. It'll all come together. It's one beautiful picture of redemption painted from Genesis to Revelation. You get from chapter 4 to chapter 5, and and now it begins to make sense. Uh, He sees this dark deep red stone, this immovable stone sitting on the throne. That's what he describes God as. He sees this stone and then in chapter 5 he starts to make us understand what he's referring to and he erupts in this praise. He he erupts in worship uh, like we were doing earlier. Holy, holy are you Lord. Holy, holy are you Lord. He says to the Lord he, he says with a loud voice in fact he and all the elders and all the saints in heaven. There's this image in chapter 5 of Revelation of them all shouting to the lamb that was slain receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor he describes this stone in chapter 4 but he explains the stone in chapter 5 the stone was a reference to the red blood that would be shed by the spotless lamb that was slain from the beginning from the foundations of the world the lamb was slain. Chapter 4 was God as alpha or beginning. But chapter 5 is God as omega or God as ending. In chapter 4 he says I see something I don't quite understand but I just see red and in chapter 5 they're celebrating victoriously with the king of kings and lord of lords. But if I were to ask you to paint a picture of victory you wouldn't paint a red rock. If I were to ask you to describe a picture of victory, you certainly would not describe a blood-covered, slaughtered lamb. But when John says, I want to worship the most victorious image. I mean, we're at the end of the narrative of Scripture. We're at the back of the book. We're at the end of the Bible. And he says, I want to just paint the picture of the greatest image of victory that the world would ever know. It's not a knight in shining armor with a flaming sword. It's not some army of power and might. But he shows us a picture of a red stone turned into a slain lamb that from the foundation of the world was destined to go to Calvary for your sins and for mine. Hear me today when I tell you today we celebrate the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. From the foundation of the world he was slain so that you and I might have life. So that you and I might have life more abundantly he was slain. Oh I feel the Lord here today. There's another picture of redemption in the Bible all the way back in the beginning. The story of Cain and Abel. Two brothers. Two brothers that were born of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve had these two boys and and the story of these boys it doesn't go so well. Sometimes brothers fight but, but then there's Cain and Abel. They didn't just fight but they both gave offerings and, and maybe you've heard the story, maybe you haven't but let me summarize it for you. They were both required to give offerings to the Lord. And Abel's offering was accepted because it involved blood. Because he slayed 
a lamb, an animal. There can be no atonement without bloodshed. You say, oh, that's bloody. It's 2023. Why are you talking about that? That's not politically correct. Eh. <laughs> the Bible's not really politically correct. And I'm not really trying to rectify that. <laughs> and neither should you be. <laughs> the Bible is biblically accurate. The world is culturally perverted. The Bible is historically accurate. The world is culturally confused. I'll stick with the Bible every time. <laughs> Cain offered an inappropriate sacrifice and I can see I can see Cain sitting off the side watching fire fall on his brother's sacrifice and being jealous in his heart and instead of getting his heart right the idea of Cain is now to try to crucify his brother hear me anytime your eyes are turned to fight to your brother or your sister instead of the enemy you have the spirit of Cain on your life that's not what I'm preaching about, but that's what I'm preaching about right now. Let me say it again. Anytime you start looking to attack your brother or your sister, and he should have just humbled himself, repented, and done right. And the Lord said, so I would have accepted your offering. He's no better than you. Anytime the enemy turns your eye to war with your brother, you have the spirit of Cain. You need to pray off of your life. Then Cain kills his brother. And when he kills his brother, he slays his brother. And, and, and blood is, is spilled. But hear me. And, and many, many, Cain does like many others today do. He blamed his failures on somebody else. Oh, Holy Ghost, help me. This is as old as the Bible. The first family in the Bible got us started on this blame game. Oh, it's their fault. It's her fault. I was raised this way. My mommy made me do it. My daddy made No, at some point, you put your big boy pants on and you make your own decisions. And at some point, I got to be humble enough to come to the Lord and say, you know what? I did this. They didn't do this. They didn't do this. I'm not this way because they mistreated me. They offended me. They didn't. Well, I'm trying to wind up, but I feel something crawling up on me. Hear me. If all somebody has to do to offend you is not shake your hand. If all somebody has to do to offend you is look at you with a questionable gaze. Woo, they ain't the problem. You're the problem. Go look into me. Repent. There's an altar. That's what redemption is for. Jesus can change your heart. Jesus can... Are we okay? Everybody okay? That, 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 that's not the problem. That's as old as Cain. That's what Cain did. Cain was the one who brought the inappropriate sacrifice. Cain was the one who killed his brother. Cain was the one who jealous. Uh, but he blamed it on his brother. He blamed it on everybody else. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be like Cain. Hear me. But God takes Cain. Watch this. Cain should have been killed. And this is my message. Cain should have been killed. He should have been executed. He should have been judged. But it's a perfect picture of Calvary. The innocent died so that the guilty would live. If you fast forward a couple thousand years to a hill called Calvary, the innocent died so that the guilty might live. Don't get too mad at Cain because you and I are Cain in the story. We are Cain. The innocent died so that the guilty might live. And the Bible says God looked at Cain in Genesis chapter 4. He looked at Cain. And the Bible says he put a mark on Cain in verse 15. The Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. In other words, if there's anybody that wanted to do anything to Cain, God marked Cain. Now, there's lots of debate about what that mark is. 
Some think it was a cross on his forehead. Some think he was marked with leprosy or insanity so that nobody would get near him. Some think that he had some wound in his flesh. Uh, uh, There's all kinds of things and theories out there. The bottom line is, the Bible doesn't say. (laughs) But here's what we know. You ready for this? Cain should have been killed. But God marked him. God did not mark him for destruction. God marked him with redemption. God marked a man who didn't deserve another chance with a mark that said, if you touch him, you will die. God took a man that didn't deserve another opportunity. And God said, I'm going to give you another chance. I'm going to give you another opportunity. I'm going to give you my... That's what the amazing grace of God is all about. I know there's some of you sitting here as saints this morning, but you weren't born saints. You were born a bunch of ain'ts. Everybody in this room, myself included, God's redemption might make you a saint, but don't forget you were born an ain't, and there is no ain't that God can't make into a saint if they'll give themselves to the process of redemption. Some of you may be old enough to remember, many are not, when bottles like this old bottles would be marked with their redeemable value on them. Old bottles like this that you would find perhaps laying around. You could pick up and redeem because they had value. You didn't throw them away because when you brought them back to the store, anybody remember that? There's still some bottles like that. You you buy jugs of milk, you buy... I wish everybody would get excited about redemption. Some folks ain't very excited about redemption because you don't recognize how good God's been in your life. You think it's because you're smart. You think it's because you're business savvy. You think it's because you're gifted. No, it's not. It's by the mercy and the grace of God that you're blessed. It's by the mercy and the grace of God that you're where you are. God could have just as easily marked you for destruction, but he marked you for mercy. He marked you for redemption. These old bottles would be marked for redemption because even though they were empty, I'm preaching to some people that have been life has emptied you out. There's not much left. You don't feel, you feel like you're at your wit's end. You're not sure you have much else to give. And life has just kind of tossed you to the side. But I've come to preach today that in God's economy, as long as there is breath in your body, there is redeemable value in your life. As long as there is breath in your body, God is not done with you yet. Your ministry is not over. Your gifting is not finished. Your calling has not been erased. God has a purpose for your life. As we stand together, I feel his presence here right now. I feel his presence here. What you had to do to redeem the bottle. What you had to do to redeem the bottle was you had to find something that somebody else had discarded. Something somebody else had thrown away. Can I tell you, society is good at throwing people away. Society is good at throwing people out. Society is good at saying, you've made mistakes, you're in the trash. And, and, And we have people all over the Quad Cities that are piled up in the trash heap of life and and there's no value in them and teachers have told them it's worthless and friends and family have told them they're worthless but let me tell you what the church is this church, I can't speak for any other church but this church is a redemption center 
This church is where we bring things that are emptied out, that life has wasted, and we bring them back to the foot of the cross. And He makes worthy what is unworthy. He puts value in what is invaluable. Oh, somebody respond to heaven right now. I feel His presence in this place. His presence is in this room. You know why? Because somebody is here needing redemption. Somebody's in this room and you need the gift of redemption in your life. You you, you may have been empty. You may have been spent. But I'm telling you, there's a God today that looks at you and says there is redeemable value in your life. Don't throw it away dude that's gross pastor why would we reuse that bottle so many yeah that's some folks problem they look at people who've been beat up damaged by sin and they say dude that's gross I wouldn't want any of that in my yeah well God give us a reminder of where he's brought us from can I tell you there is no sin that is too dark there is no past that is so checkered hear me We don't celebrate sin in church. In fact, you can't have redemption if you don't repent of your sins. Repent is a turnaround. When I repent, repentance literally means a 180. It means I've been walking this way, and I turn and walk that way. Some of you are living in sin right now. You got sin in your life. And the reason you don't feel like you could ever do anything for God is because you have a pet called sin. God can't redeem you while you're sinning. He can't forgive you of your sins while you're sinning. I can't baptize you and and, and God won't fill you with this spirit if you're knowingly sinning. But when I come to him in repentance, I say, God, I'm emptied of my way. I've walked so far. I've hurt so much. I'm, I've, I've been, I've had disappointment. I'm, I'm wounded. I'm broken. I, I, I want your way. And when I empty myself in repentance, he says, I'll fill you up. I'll refill you with my spirit empty yourself in repentance I'll put something in you that you didn't come with when you when you empty yourself in repentance I'll put something in you that you didn't come into this room with I'll fill you up with the gift of my spirit I'll fill you up with a brand new life I'll fill you up Come on, this altar's open. I'm inviting anyone that would to join me here. I'm inviting anyone that needs the mercy of God in your life. If you need the strength and the power of God in your life, you ought to come to this altar and just lift up your hands.